Great, it's recording now. Uh, We're going to start this uh, lecture by going over Desmos activity three, which is about uh, sketchy derivatives. So I gave you the link, right? Just click in there. Uh, and then you will be um, looking at this um, screen. Uh, you may sign in if you have a Desmos account, right? Or you can just click here, continue without signing in for you to get an idea of how the activity goes, right? I'm gonna just click in here and this is gonna give me a choice. I will write a name of a good mathematician. Let me enter with uh, John Nash. John Nash, a great mathematician. Uh, there is even a movie about his uh, life, right? Um, beautiful mind and all that. So let's enter John Nash. All right, great. This is the first challenge. The first challenge. Um, Deep, welcome. We just started. Uh, here is the link for you to uh, go to Desmos Activity 3. Here, just click in there, please. And then you will enter and you will see the first challenge. The first challenge says, sketch the derivative of the graph shown here. Sketch the derivative of this graph, right? So how can we do that? And let me tell you, in this activity, you will have tools. You will have a way to write on the board yourself with a mouse to draw lines, to type something, uh, to do some computation and to erase. In case you don't want to show something, you can erase. And also it will be, you will have access to colors, okay? Very good. So now they are asking us to figure out the derivative of a function whose graph is this, right? Whose graph is this? So um, one way to do it is to uh, figure out the equation of this line. If we have the equation of this line, then we can easily take the derivative and graph the derivative of the function, right? Yeah, that's one way. Another way should be to analyze where the derivative is zero, right? And then um, kind of um, play around with that. But uh, better perhaps if we find the function and get its derivative, right? So what should be the equation of this line? Well, one thing we can do is this, right? We can compute the slope. Look at the y-intercept here, right? Y-intercept, it's at level minus three, right? Minus three. And The slope also can be found. Notice you can erase if you want to here. So y equal y intercept minus three, right? But the slope, the slope, probably we can find the slope this way, right? The slope is rise over run. So the rise and the run can be found if we go here and up here, right? Look, the run is two, the rise is one. So the rise over the run will lead to one half, right? One half. So one half should be the slope, right? And minus three because the y-intercept is minus three, right? So one half of x minus three is the function, but if this is the function, anyone could tell me what should be the derivative of this function, the derivative, so we can graph it, the derivative of the function. You can say it, okay, it's right in the chat. One by two. Uh -huh. Excellent, excellent math. The derivative clearly should be one half, right? And what I'm doing here, you can do two with a mouse, right? You can write stuff there. I will see it. I will, I will give you credit for that. Okay, so the derivative one half, right? That's my state. Great, so then how can I graph this derivative here? Well, I look for the level one half. This is one, two, three, four, right? 
I look for the level one half, which is here clearly, right? And then the derivative is a constant function. So it will be always equal to one half, right? So it's a graph, graph of a constant function is a horizontal line at level one half, right? At level one half there. Mm -hmm. Very good. So then let's draw a line. For that, you will have this tool, this tool that you can use and then draw the line at the level one half. Right? So that's it. That will be good enough, right? So I see this, I will give you credit. All right? So that was the first challenge, right? At one half, you draw your line. And then the colors, again, if you don't like this color, you can change it for another color, the, the color of your choice, the thickness of your drawing also look thicker, less thicker. All right, so this is one way to solve it, right? Might be other ways, just feel free to explore different ways of solving it and just post a solution. Feel free to write out stuff here, right? You have a tool now. All right, that was the challenge one. Let's go ahead and take a look at the challenge two. Uh -huh. Challenge two, it says, it sketch the derivative of the graph shown here. Now they're asking me to sketch the derivative of this function, right? It's a quadratic function, right? Opens downward. So the first coefficient should be negative, right? And now let's take full advantage of this word, a sketch. When they say sketch, it means that you don't have to be precise, exact, right? You just have to kind of give us an idea of what the graph of this derivative, the derivative of this function should be, right? For that, guys, uh, if you want to be exact, you could to figure out the equation of this parabola, right? The quadratic equation of this parabola and then take the derivative, but I give you this hint. Maybe it's easier to do it this way since it's just a sketch. Look, look for the point where the derivative is zero. Look, if you go up here, you reach this top, right? Right there, derivative zero, tangent line is horizontal, right? And then you continue here, derivative negative. Derivative positive, derivative zero, derivative negative. So at this point in your graph, you have to have zero there, right? The derivative must be zero. Over here, since you are increasing from left to right, right? You are increasing, if you walk along the graph, increasing, then the derivative positive, right? Derivative positive. So this is zero, the derivative positive here, and it's increasing, right? Positively increasing. And then over here, derivative should be negative, right? Derivative negative. Mm -hmm. You're know, having this in mind, then from left to right, the derivative should be zero here. And actually here, the derivative is positive, but it's losing value, right? Getting closer and closer to zero, right? So it's positive, but it's headed to zero, right? To become zero. So a line like this should be a null, perhaps, right? And then over here is negative, negative a line like this should be null. So draw something like this, right? Again, guys, in this um, activity, you don't have to be uh, precise. This is a sketch of so something like this, I would accept, for example, right? Important that, um, yeah, let's, let's do it again. We can always erase, right? If you don't like what we do. For example, something like this would be sort of enough, right? Feel free to look. What is important is that the derivative is zero here and before here positive headed to zero and then after, after negative, you see, right? This is the graph of the derivative, right? F prime of X. And now let me go back here, F prime of X, right? We'll have this graph where f of x have this graph. You follow guys? Just draw a line going through zero at this point, right? Important here, that, that the derivative zero. Mm -hmm. All right, great, great. Now, guys, now here, for example, you can write right derivative here at this point zero, right? At the peak. All right, moving on. Next challenge. You have questions, guys, feel free to ask me. Aha, another one, look, they give you this function. 
and they say figure out the sketch of the derivative of this function. All right. Now, question for you guys. When you look at this function, based on your knowledge from pre-calculus or based on your previous knowledge, what do you think this function resembles to? What, what, I will give you a hint. What trigonometric function does it resemble? Anybody? You can write it in the chat or you can say it. Mm -hmm. mm. Aha, someone wrote something on the chat. Yeah. Very good, very good. Two students, three students. Aha, deep, you got it, sign. It says, uh, my also sign. Miguel, cosine, yeah, both, but, but sine is the one, I think, because remember sine, it starts at, at the zero, then goes up here, then comes down again and closes a cycle, right? This is sine, sine function. So, aha, uh -huh. so I have in mind the function sine, the function sine, all right? That would help, right? But let's say you don't remember that the function whose graph is this is sine, then you can do what I did before, right? Look, at the peaks, at the peaks on the original function, the derivative is zero, right? Look, zero, derivative here, zero, here. So in the, when you graph, your derivative here has to be zero, right? Another peak here, but actually it's uh, the floor valley, right? The bottom of the valley, so zero here, derivative, right? So zero here. Top of a mountain, zero derivative. So the derivative zero here, more or less, right? So I have three points of the graph, right? I play the same game here. Look, bottom of a valley, zero. Top of a mountain, zero. Bottom of a valley, zero. So the graph has to go through these three points, right? Also notice, when you are here, if you draw the tangent line, it's an inflection point slope one, right, more or less. So more or less, this should be derivative one. When you are here, notice that the derivative will be negative one, right, negative one. So more or less here, they should go with negative one. Uh -huh. Here, look again, tangent line as a slope one, so more or less one here, right? Here again, negative one slope, right? Slope negative one. It's here, a slope negative one, right? At this value. Here, a slope one, so one here, and so on, right? So now when you connect those points, those dots, I'm gonna use a different color, I'm gonna use green. What is gonna happen, look, when you connect these dots? Aha, uh -huh, indeed, it's gonna give you a function that look like the one that we had before, right? But this resembles which function? The green one. Uh huh. Aha, uh -huh, deep. Miguel, yeah, you guys made my day. Cosine, right? Cosine. Yeah, consistent with the fact that the, the red one was resembling, this one was resembling f of x equal sine of x, right? Derivative of sine, cosine, right? Derivative of sine, cosine. So therefore, this guy should be cosine, the green one, right? Let's write it here, let's, let's write it here. Yeah, I, I feel free guys to, to justify this um, the way you want, right? The way you want, we said derivative of sine is cosine, right? So they should be the graph of this guy, right? Yeah, so there we go. This one, just call it g of x equal cosine because it's the derivative of sine, right? Yeah, this is one way you can do it. Yeah, feel free to use these tools to do your, your, your graphing, okay? It will help you, right? Yeah, but you can write this stuff in words there. Again, you have the tools there, just write out stuff. Uh, I will give you credit for that. Mm -hmm. And if you do something wrong, don't worry, you can always erase here with this. You can type. All right, guys, that was challenge three, right? Challenge three. Let's move on. Let's see what comes next. 
Aha, uh -huh. this is another challenge here. They are asking you to figure out, given this function, consider the function whose graph is shown in red, which of this graph could be the derivative, could be the derivative. And I'm gonna give you a hint here. This guy looks like, what function do anybody, what, what function does it resemble? Anybody? Yeah, here they are. Ah, yeah, deep, yeah, uh, but uh, remember, uh, deep, this one is growing forever, right? Keeps increasing, doesn't come back like the previous, right? So it looks like uh, half of the sideways parabola, right? Half of the sideways parabola. So I would say, uh, let me give you this hint. I would identify this with y equal square root of x or f of x equal square root of x, right? So try to uh, get the derivative of this function and try to choose one of those four graphs. So f of x. F of x, f of x equal square root of x, right? And hint, the derivative of the square root function, square root of x in simplified form is this, right? One over twice square root of x. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let's call this graph A, B, C and D. Anyone could tell us what is the graph of the derivative of this function? What is the graph of this? Uh huh. Aha, uh -huh, ma. Yeah, very good, very good. Yeah, good, good. Aha, uh -huh, ma is saying this one. Yeah, I actually agree with that because look, uh, first of all, right, this when you take the derivative of this guy, it is a positive graph, right? So cannot be this because this is on the bottom. Here's a negative graph, no? Uh, perhaps the, any of these three, right? But now think about it, like one over, one over. Reciprocal of this, right? When this is growing, it, the reciprocal is gonna be decreasing, right? Decreasing, yeah? You can help yourself also with the, yeah, in Desmos Grapher, yeah, use the Desmos graphing, right? Graph this, right? And see which which shape is showing, right? And when you do that, you will see that I think this is the shape because this is increasing graph, but this is a reciprocal. So this will be a decreasing graph, right? From left to right. So the only one that is decreasing is this. This one is increasing, this one is increasing. So I will go with this, yeah. So um, the, this one activity wants you to click in here, right? Click and, and show that it's this one. Yeah, very good. And then you have to explain, right? I would say since the given graph is increasing, is increasing and positive, right? increasing and positive, then, then the graph of the derivative which is this the graph of this right graph of the derivative derivative should be positive and decreasing because it's a reciprocal, right? You can add that too. Yeah, you, you can write stuff here as much as you want, right? I'm gonna just say that, I'm gonna submit. The graph is increasing. I'm positive the graph of the derivative, which is this, right? You figure that out, should be positive and decreasing. Submit. Uh-huh. There you go. And then when you guys write more stuff, you will get to see um, what your peers have written, right? Yeah, but definitely this one. Mm -hmm. 
next yeah and let's erase this which was written with uh, with zoom uh -huh, another one the derivative of some function is shown here this is the derivative of a function right this is kind of a backward thinking now which is going to be helpful when we look at anti-derivative later so the derivative of some function is shown here in blue which of this graph could be the original function, right? So this is the graph of the derivative. Now, which of these three should be the graph of the original function? It's sort of a backward thinking, right? Backward thinking. Yeah, so this right here is this graph of derivative, right? Graph of derivative. You got to figure out what is the graph of the original function. It's very tricky. Graph of f prime what is the graph graph of f which one of this let's call it a b and c which one do you think should be the graph of the original function mm -hmm. very tricky yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, I will give you a hint, right? If the derivative is a constant function, right? Just like the one that we saw before, right? At the very beginning, the first challenge, right? Remember the original function was like this, right? Like this, and we got a constant function. So let's look for that shape, right? Maybe this, or maybe this, right? Cannot be this, right? If this is the derivative, it comes from a linear function, right? Comes from a linear function. So perhaps this, perhaps this. Then also look at this. Here, if you walk along your graph, the derivative is decreasing, decreasing, right? And at certain point becomes zero, derivative here is zero. We should write here decreasing, derivative decreasing, derivative positive. Ah, Conja, yeah, you made my day. C, yeah, it's tricky, very tricky. But yeah, very good, because this, notice that here, over here, right? On this part, derivative positive. And on this part, derivative negative, right? If the derivative positive means that the function should be increasing, so it increases here, right? Up to here. Then derivative zero here, right? Derivative zero, look here. And then derivative negative when the function decreases, right? So excellent. Oh, yeah, yeah, this is it, right? Yeah. Yep. And there is even a choice none of the all, but I think this is a good one. All right, great. Yeah, probably one more challenge and then we will go back to like one or two more challenges. Yeah, let me just, let me help you out here. Okay, let's clear this up, okay? Yeah, uh, clear this up and choose this, right? Clear this up, choose this one we said, right? It's gonna be the one. So click in there and explain, right? So you can say uh, derivative was positive first, right? Positive, then uh, then increasing up to here, derivative zero with this, right? Mm -hmm. And then derivative decreasing, right? Derivative constant, maybe I can you say right? Derivative, derivative is constant. Derivative is positive. Here, right, reaches zero, derivative is zero. And finally, derivative is negative. Derivative is negative. Yeah, you can write something like this. You don't have to be formal, guys. I'm, I'm writing basically the main idea, right? Derivative constant tells you that it's a line increasing and positive, right? And positive. Tells me that it's a linear function increasing from left to right, right? This. Then derivative is positive here, reaches a point when derivative is zero here, the peak of the mountain, and then derivative is negative. This will suffice, I think. Yeah. Very good, very good. All right, let's see one more challenge, perhaps one more challenge. Let's see this one now. Uh -huh, this one, uh, feel free to approximate things because it's a sketch. Uh, a sketch the derivative of the graph shown here. So this is the function. 
figure out its derivative. Uh, let's start with the easy part, the, the linear part, right? When, when the graph is aligned, you know, then it's easy to find the derivative because this has a slope one, right? How do you know, Professor, a slope one? Well, because rise over run is one, right? One over one, one. The slope one means that the derivative will be equal to one, right? Over here, equal to one. So we can just say, uh -huh, this derivative equal to one here, up to here, one. Suddenly the curve increases, right? Increases. Uh, and sometimes students ask me when I do this, what, what kind of curve is that professor? This, this is it's indeed a quarter of a circle, a quarter of a circle. It's not a parabola, really a quarter of a circle, but you don't have to come up with the exact graph. You can just approximate the graph. Look, what is important is this, that when you walk along this curve, you are increasing, right? So your derivative should be positive. So the derivative is increasing, increasing, uh, the positive, sorry, uh, but decreasing in reality because it's gonna be a point when the derivative will be zero here, right? Because the tangent line is zero here, so here is zero. More or less, uh, the curve will come down like this, right? To zero. So from here, and the derivative here doesn't exist because it's a vertical line. So this will be kind of asymptotic perhaps but definitely the derivative will be zero there. So draw some curve, right? A curve that asymptotic here, and then coming down, right? Coming down here, zero. Yeah, that would be good. Then here, constant, derivative of a constant function is zero, right? So here definitely the derivative should be here, a constant function, right? The decreasing here, derivative negative, right? Negative, negative, so decreasing negatively. And then suddenly here, zero, right? Mm -hmm. So there's gonna be a jump there, right? So derivative here, definitely zero. After that, increasing the derivative. So after that, it will increase perhaps like this, right? But perhaps since this is negative, perhaps the derivative will be this, right? At this point, derivative negative, so starts at some point. Derivative zero is important and then continues that way, right? If you don't like what you did, just erase, do it again, guys. I wanna see some drawings there of you. So feel free to do this, right? Yeah, something like that would be good. Yeah, uh, now uh, maybe the last question should be this. Yeah, you should go back to lecture. Yeah, you should uh, figure this out, guys. It says, a scalar says she found a function that has the same exact graph as its derivative. Linda thinks that's crazy talk, impossible, she says. Who is right, the Skyler or Linda? Is it possible to come up with a graph that is exactly the same as the graph of the derivative of a function? What do you think, guys? And if that's true, give us an example, right? What would be that function whose derivative is the same, basically? Mm -hmm. Remember? I will give you a hint. Try to remember exponential functions, right? Remember when we look at exponential functions, we found a function whose derivative was itself. Okay, guys, what about this function, f of x? f of x, uh -huh, we have a way to write it. What about this function, f of x equal, equal, um, f of x equal. You remember this function, guys? f of x equal e to the x. What is the derivative of this function? Anybody? Oh, itself, itself. Aha, uh -huh. very good, Ganja. Very good, guys, right? So this would be, serve as an example. So which who is right then? The Skylar or Linda? Who is right? Uh, Skylar. Skylar, excellent, right? Because Skylar is saying she found a function uh, that has the same exact graph as its derivative. Well, this is the function, right? Yes, well, very good, very good, excellent, excellent there. So this is the function, right? 
And you can graph it if you want to. So like this, R1 right, then increasing. Right? This is f of x equal e to the x. Very good, guys. Very good. So it's scale, right? Yeah, very good. You get, and then um, you can justify by saying that the function f of x equal e to the x e to the x has derivative f prime of x equal e to the x, right? Very good, guys. Yeah. And then you share with the class, right? What you wrote there. Mm -hmm. Let me write equal here. Very good. Okay, has derivative. Uh -huh. And then if you created an account in Desmos, you can always change this, refine these answers, right? So feel free to, aha, uh -huh. students have uh, gone, yeah, very good, very good, right? Yep, yeah, write out your stuff. Then, then I will give you credit for that, guys. Yeah, and then uh, I think that there are no more challenges actually, right? That That's all. So try to try to uh, do this in your own, in your own at home, your own words. Okay. You don't have to do what I did here, right? And then, uh, yeah, go ahead. Questions? Any questions? Let's go to the sixth one. Uh, six one. What will happen? Six one. I just want to have a look at it. Oh, the, the first challenge? No, sixth. The sixth challenge. Ah, the, the, this one. Yeah, when we said it's a, the slope one here, then it will be a constant function at level one, positive derivative. Then continues, the derivative continues being positive up to here because here the derivative is zero. Then the derivative of this guy is zero. Decreasing here, so somehow the function starts at the negative value. Derivative here is zero, right? And then continues growing positively the derivative, right? Got it, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome, you're welcome. Okay, guys, so enough. So let's go to, if there are this most more stuff to do, you have to complete it, right? Yeah, but I think we, we did well here. All right. Let's close this and then let's go to the lecture. Today we have to talk about uh, limits at infinity and asymptotes. Since this chapter is long, I have broken it down into parts. Today we will do the part one and on Wednesday in person at BMCC, I will do the second part, okay? So let's uh, explain this by looking at this example. In order to tell you about limits at infinity, let me uh, use this uh, very well-known rational function f of x equal one over x. It is called in the mathematical lingo the reciprocal function, right? The reciprocal function. Now, the graph of this reciprocal function is shown below here. It's a curve here, a curve here, right? Now, if you forgot the, the shape of this graph, you can always use our graphing tool, right? one over x is there, right? This is the graph that I have here. You may say, professor, but I see that this graph, this curve is touching the y-axis. But in reality, if you zoom in, if you zoom in, you will see that that's not the case, right? They are always separated. It's just that the curve gets closer and closer to the y-axis and similarly here, closer and closer to the x-axis. So this is a good representation, okay? That's the graph. Great, now, um, what is important here is this, if you, uh, do the following when, when you are when your values of x input values when they approach this positive infinity or yes infinity the y values the y values will approach will approach what well no hard to see that if you travel in this direction along the curve the y values will decrease and decrease right will get smaller and smaller headed to zero but never actually being zero, right? The curve gets closer and closer to the x-axis, but never touches it. So when x approaches infinity, I can say that y approaches zero. zero. Now, this behavior formally, mathematics, mathematicians have captured this behavior formally as follows. They will say that the limit of this function one over x, as x approaches infinity, notice this is not a number, it's a symbol, right? As x approaches infinity, it just tells you that you're going in this direction. This is equal to zero, zero, right? Zero, this guy. 
Now I have a question for you guys. Uh, what will happen if I approach input wise to minus infinity? Now we said that this is zero, right? But now what will happen if I approach negative infinity, meaning if I go in this direction, where are the Y values going? What do you think? Anybody could tell us in the chat or verbally? Where do you think the Y values are going? What Y is becoming what value or getting closer and closer to what value? Uh-huh, very good, very good. Uh-huh, deep, very good, very good, right? Also zero, right? Because look, the Y values are getting smaller and smaller, right? The curve is never touching the x-axis, but the values are getting smaller and smaller in the limit mathematicians say, okay, this should be zero, zero, okay? Great, so when X approaches negative infinity, then Y approaches zero, right? Zero. Formally, then we can say that the limit of one over X as X approaches minus infinity, zero, right? Zero. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good, very good. Now, uh, this is an idea of how these limits at infinity work, right? Here are the formal definitions. But before we go over the formal definitions, I want you to catch something very important. Whenever this behavior is shown, right? Whenever this behavior is shown, this line, this line is special, right? The curve gets closer and closer to this line, right? Never touching it. This line is called a horizontal asymptote, okay? Horizontal asymptote, let's write it nicely here. Horizontal asymptote. asymptote. All right, all right. Now, uh, the definitions for limited infinity, the formal definitions are as follows. It says, if the values of f of x, the output values become arbitrarily close, to some real number L, in our case, that real number was zero, right? As X becomes sufficiently large, as X is headed to positive infinity, right? We will say that the limit of F of X as X approaches infinity is equal to L. Similarly, if the values of F of X, the output values become arbitrarily close to some real number L, in our case, that L was zero, as X is smaller than zero, for x is smaller than zero, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah, so we can become sufficiently large. Yeah, but in this case, since we are going the, in the opposite direction, we have to be careful for x less than zero as the absolute value becomes sufficiently large, right? Going to minus infinity, we will say that the limit of the function f of x as x approaches negative infinity equal to L. Now, if this guy matches with this guy, then we will say that the limit at plus minus infinity exists, but that's coming next. Now, important here, if you get that the limit of f of x as x approaches infinity equal to L, or the limit of f of x as x approaches negative infinity equal to L, then you got yourself a horizontal asymptote, right? This, this, this horizontal asymptote, right? When you see this behavior. Uh -huh. And the horizontal asymptote will have an equation that will be this, y equal L, y equal to the limit, right? To the limit, the limit at infinity. And this will be the horizontal asymptote of F. Okay, guys, let's, um, let me give you an example for you to visualize all these abstract concepts, right? Suppose they say compute the following limit, limit as X approaches infinity of five minus three over X. This is a rational function, right? Let's try to find its limit. Okay, so one thing I can do is this, I can distribute my limit over mm -hmm, and say that that will be equal to the limit of the constant function five as X approaches infinity minus the limit, the limit as X approaches infinity of this function three over X. Aha. Uh -huh. Now the limit of a constant function, since constant functions do not change, this is equal just to five, right? Five mm -hmm. minus the limit of this guy. 
do this trick. Limit as x approaches infinity of three times one over x. Professor, why you are separating three from one over x? Well, I know how to deal with this reciprocal function, right? I showed you before. So that's why I'm doing the separation, okay? And I know that the constants can be taken outside the limit, right? So I will get this three times limit as x approaches infinity of one over x, right? But what is this limit? Anybody could tell us? We just saw it. Mm -hmm. What is the limit of one over x as x approaches infinity? Think of this x being a million, one billion. What would be this quotient? Aha, mm -hmm. uh -huh. yeah, I see on the chat. Aha, uh -huh. math, deep, also very good. Zero, right, zero. Yeah, we just saw it, right, remember? Limit as x approaches infinity of one over x, zero, zero, right, because of this. So this is zero. So therefore, then we end up with this, right? This will be zero. We end up just with five. Aha, uh -huh. we got this behavior. Then we can say that the horizontal asymptote, then horizontal asymptote will be given by this equation, y equal five, right? Y equal five. Mm -hmm. Very good, guys, very good. All right. So now let's explore the square of the reciprocal function. Um, suppose they say compute this limit, the limit of one over x squared as x approaches infinity. And then the limit of one over x squared as x approaches minus infinity. Okay, so solution here, let's start with A. What will be this limit? Well, we have a tool to graph, right? So let's use our graphing tool. The graph of the square of the reciprocal function the graph of the square of the reciprocal function is just this function, right? Well, this, this graph, there's, looks like a volcano, right? Mm -hmm. This is the graph of y equal one over x squared. Now, x approaches infinity, which lives here, right? So if you approach via x to infinity, the output values are coming down, right? Are coming down, coming down. So this limit then should be what? They're decreasing, decreasing, headed to zero, zero, right? Mm -hmm. Similarly, for part B, limit as X approaches infinity of one over X squared, approaches minus infinity now, right? Minus infinity. Well, with that, well, if you take a look at the graph, right? Which can be found also in case you uh, don't remember this volcano shape using your graphing calculator, right? The, the volcano is there, right? Yeah. So using our graph, we can trace it, right? But this time headed to negative infinity, which is here, right? Which is here. Let's use a different color now. Negative infinity is here. So if you approach negative infinity this way, Input wise, output wise, what's happening? This is happening, right? Output wise. The value of the y's are decreasing and decreasing, headed to zero. So this also zero, right? Zero. Yeah. But now catch this, guys. Look at this guy. It is even, right? The exponent. And this is leading to zero here. This is also even. Try to keep that in mind. Later we will use it. So mathematicians discover then that uh, when you have this form one over x to the n, when x approaches infinity or minus infinity, in general, this limit should be zero, zero, as long as your n, the exponent is positive, right? It could be positive one, positive two. You may say, where is positive one, professor? Well, here, here, I show you some result, right? Look, with one, also zero here one over a power of x, as long as the exponent is positive, in the limit will give us always zero, zero, okay? Zero, zero. Try to remember that this will help us a lot for what is coming, okay? This is fact. Now, for example, right quickly here, you can see using this property, what should be the limit as x approaches negative infinity of one over x to the nine? Well, zero. Uh, zero, excellent, right? Because nine bigger than zero directly. What about number two? What should be the limit that x approaches infinity of one over x to the eight? Zero. 
zero, right? Excellent, right? As, as soon as you see the exponent positive, could be x could be headed to negative infinity or positive infinity, zero, zero. What about this one? What should be this? Let me separate this, right? Just yes, to be formal. And then, I'll, yeah, what do you think should be this? Uh huh. One third comes out and we end up with this, right? But what is this guy? Limit of one over x to a 12. Zero. Aha, exactly. uh -huh. excellent, excellent, gorgeous. <clears throat> zero, right? This is zero and zero times any number, any number zero. So very good, excellent. So zero, right? So I, I wanted to get this, right? Whenever you have a big a power of x and x is going either to infinity or minus infinity, it's zero, zero, zero. We were going to use that a lot. Next. Now, this is for the form one over a power of x, right? But what happens if it's not one over a power of x, it's the power of x itself. Well, then we have to be careful. For example, if I ask me for the limit of x squared as x approaches infinity, then we have to think of the graph of a parabola, right? The parabola. If you are approaching infinity input wise, Output wise, you are going up, you are going up, right? Going up to positive infinity. So this should be positive infinity, right? Now, uh, sometimes it's, it's uh, uh -huh, deep, very good, right? Sometimes it's not easy to use the graph. I give you an alternative, alternative here. Alternative, you can do this. You can think of plugging this guy into the function. You can think of plugging 1 million into this function. 1 million square is like a billion, even bigger. So this definitely infinity, right? Either using the graph or plugging this into thinking of infinity as a big number. Similarly here, look, what should be the limit of x squared as x approaches negative infinity? Negative infinity. Net, but, but negative infinity is square, right? What happened when oh, you square it's infinity. Positive infinity, right? Gets the sign gets positive because of the square, right? Even, mm -hmm. even try to make this connection. Even powers will lead to positive infinity. But now here, let's do it with a odd power. If you take the limit as x approaches infinity to x cubed, think of substituting here a big number such as a million and cubing it. What do you think we will get here? Mm -hmm. Infinity or negative infinity? What do you think? While you think about it, yeah, I will use the graph also, right? Which is another approach in case, uh -huh. yeah, math, just very infinity. good math. Just infinity, deep also where, yeah, just infinity, right? The cube of a positive number when it's big is just a huge number infinity, right? And the graph also backs it up because look, if you move towards infinity, the output values will grow without bound, right? Will grow without bound towards infinity, right? This is sort of algebraically, this is using the graph. Very good. What about, what about D? What about D? What negative infinity. Negative infinity, right? The cube of a negative number is a negative number, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, negative infinity. Very good, deep. very good. Yeah, very good, very good. Negative infinity, right? This is negative infinity, right? The cube of negative number, negative number. Now, the graph should back it up, right? Look, the graph of the cubic function is this chair. So if you are going to negative infinity, Input wise, output wise, you this is what is happening, right? The, the output value is decreasing without bound headed to negative infinity, right? So therefore this is negative infinity. Very good, very good, guys. So we're gonna use this and this a lot. So for this form, zero, 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 zero. For this form, you have to be careful, right? Depends, depends, right? We get a positive result when the exponent is even, right? Positive infinity, but when the exponent is odd, you gotta be careful, right? There are two cases here, right? Odd exponent look negative or sometimes positive. So mathematicians have summarized that here in this property, right? Say the limit as x approaches plus minus infinity of x to the n will be infinity for n even, right? And the limit as x to the n as x approaches infinity will be infinity for n odd. But if x approaches negative infinity and this is odd, it will be minus infinity, right? As we saw there. So for odd exponent, be careful, right? To test it right here. Very good, very good. Now with this quickly, we can say, for example, that the limit of x to the four, since this is even, positive infinity. Be, there you go. Just think of plugging this 
to the four powers, right? The four power will make this positive infinity, right? Or you can think of a parabola-like graph and trace it. You will be this. What about this? The limit of x to a 13, f to a 13, infinity. negative infinity, right? If you raise a negative number to a odd, odd exponent is negative, right? Or you can think of the graph of a cubic function there and do the tracing and you will get to this answer. Very good, guys, very good. Yeah, this is infinity odd. You have to be careful. Great. Now time for you to practice, guys. But for you to practice, I have to give you this, this method, okay? This method that's going to help uh, help us to find these limits in general. Method to find the limit of a rational function of the form p of x over q of x. This is the method. Step one, divide numerator and denominator by the highest power of the denominator, okay? Highest power in the sense of the exponent. You are a catch the one that has the highest exponent. Step two, simplify and using the limits laws, compute the limit. Example here, suppose they ask you to compute the limit of this rational function. Well, the step one says, right, you are supposed to catch the highest power of the denominator. When you look at the denominator, there are two terms, three X squared, and four, right? Constant term, term with degree two. So clearly this is the highest power, right? The X squared, right? The one with the highest exponent. So then you are supposed to divide both numerator and denominator by this guy, X squared, okay? Yeah, this is the most general method that will help you to compute these limits in general. So this becomes, the following, x squared into this. I'm gonna do it nicely slowly here first, then we will speed this up. It's this, right? We'll simplify later. Professor? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry, I just stepped yeah, away ahead, for Mark. a second. Yeah, yeah sure. uh, why are we dividing by um, x squared? Ah, uh -huh. yeah, let's back up a little bit, right? Yeah, we said that after doing all these calculations, we got to the point where we need a strong method, right? To deal with any rational function in general, okay? The method says two steps. Step one says divide both numerator and denominator by the highest power of the denominator. So you gotta catch the highest power, the one having the, the largest exponent, right? This is in right, this case, x right, squared, right? Okay, okay. Step one. Step two, step two says then simplify and use the limits laws that we saw before and compute the limit. Okay. Okay. Right. Sorry, yeah, I just stepped away for a second. No, no, it's, it's okay. It's okay. But the, the, the guys, don't hold things back. If something is not clear, let me know. I, I will untangle it and explain. Yeah. So we are dividing by x squared both, right? Because this is the highest power of the denominator, both numerator and denominator. When you distribute the division here, you get this, right? Here you get seven over x squared. On the denominator, you get three x squared over x squared plus four over x squared, right? Yeah, now let's use some algebra to simplify this. This will be, look, x on the top, x squared on the bottom, simplifying two over x, right? You cancel one x, but the x that is left should be placed on the bottom because it's the dominant, right? Dominant. So one x cancel, one x stays. Plus, this one is simplified, nothing to simplify, right? Over here, notice these two guys cancel x squared and x squared leaving me with the number three plus four over X squared, right? This is in simplified form what we get. Now guys, I want you to remember what we did before, right? Uh, I am going to distribute my limit over, my limit over these four components, okay? So what I'm gonna get here, this is gonna be equal to, This limit as x approaches infinity of two over x plus the limit of seven over x squared as x approaches infinity over the limit of the constant function three as x approaches infinity plus the limit of the rational function four over x squared as x approaches infinity. Now we're close to the end. But now, anyone could tell me what is this limit? Oh, what is the value of this? Where is this going? 
the limit of two over a big number. Think of one billion here into two. What is that? Anyone? Hmm? Is it infinity? Mm -hmm. Two divided by infinity. What, what should be that? Two divided by one billion, for example, right? 0. 0.000. In the limit. Ah, ma. Yeah, ma. Remember, when you have x on the top, it's there where you get infinity minus infinity. But if x is on the bottom, look, think of dividing two by one million. It will be 0. 0.000001. 0. Zero, excellent. Yeah, that, that's what I wanted to hear. This kind of, this forms zero, will be always zero. A constant divided by x, when x is big, this is zero. What about this one? Anyone? Infinity. Are you sure? Look again, look at the form. Number on the top. Oh, zero. Number on the top. Yeah, zero again. Yeah, very good, because x is big, huge. If you square something huge, even bigger, right? You square a million, you might get a billion. Into seven, you're going to be 0. 0.00007. Zero, zero. Excellent, excellent, right? Yeah, I think someone wrote something on the chat. Yeah, ma, yeah, ma, now you got it. Zero. Yeah, what about this, this guy? What is this limit? Anyone? It's a constant function, right? So this was zero plus zero. The constant function hint never changes, never changes. Even if right you go yeah, just the three, excellent, excellent, right? It's three because a constant function, even when you take limit will not change. Uh -huh. What about this? This limit, the zero. limit zero. Uh -huh. Yeah, now I see you guys got it right. Yeah, when you see this form, a number divided by x or a power of x, when x is huge, this will be the square of infinity even bigger. Bottom line, this goes to zero. So zero. Now, but, yes, do the math. go ahead. Professor, what, what happened to the, the um, property that we learned? Like when. Um, um, like equals um, infinity, like uh, uh, when the when the uh, power is uh, square, uh, uh, and when uh, yeah. the limit is infinity, what happens to that? Uh, oh yeah, we will rule. use that property. Yeah, we will use the property. I know you are talking about probably this property, right? Yes, yeah, we have that this one. this one, right? We this just one. did. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, but not if yeah. This x is not one over something or two over something, it's just x, it's the power, right? The other one, okay. the one that I'm using is this one, the one with the reciprocals, this, 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 zero, 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 remember? Okay, got it, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, this, this is the one I'm using. One over some power of x on the limit, this is zero, okay? Yes, sorry. Yeah, very got good, it. yeah, but we will use that, the other one for the tricky ones that are coming up, yeah, very good, very good. Yeah, so doing the math, zero plus zero, zero, over three plus zero, three, Three into zero is just zero. So is bottom it? line, zero, there you go. Yeah, and then I did this process step by step, showing all the, what is needed, but we will summarize this. We will do it faster next time, okay? Yeah, I, and then gradually we will uh, consider more challenging example. Can you do this? What is the limit of five X plus one over 10 X minus seven? as x approaches infinity. Hint, the step one says look for the highest power. The highest power on the denominator is x, right? So divide by x, both numerator and denominator. Simplify, and you should be able to get the answer, right? Whatever is left, could be zero, could be a real number. Whatever is left, that should be your answer. Mm -hmm. Is it D, Professor? Uh huh. Ma, uh, uh, yeah, you got it. You got it. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, it is. It is. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, I see someone else. Gonja also. Very good. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, very good, guys. Right. Once we catch the the term, I wouldn't say the term, the, 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 the highest power, right, on the denominator is x, the x to the first power, x to the first power. And we uh, go over step two. Step two says divide, right? by that top and bottom. Now this time I'm gonna do it quicker, right? I'm gonna divide each component directly, right? Yes, this way. 
Each component must be divided by x, right? Uh -huh. Now, this should be equal to the limit as x approaches infinity of x and x cancel, right? Leaving five there, minus one over x. 10 here, x and x cancels, right? Minus seven over x. But now notice guys that this guy, one over x, when x is going to infinity, goes to zero, right? Same story for this guy, seven over x, right? When x is huge, think of a million, a billion into seven, it's gonna be 0, 0.0000 in the limit zero. So remove these guys, keep these two, right? So then five over 10, and when simplify, this is just one over two, right? Final answer, one over two, excellent. Very good, great. Okay, this one you can uh, do it at home. I want to try something else. Maybe, mm, yeah, let's try this one. Can you try this? Limit of x squared plus eight over x cubed plus 11 as x approaches infinity and hint when you look for the highest power on the denominator, turns out is this, right? So divide by that everything, every component, and figure out what is left. And according to that, make your choice. Uh huh. Let's see. Uh huh. Deep. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Let me see. Let me see. Deep. Miguel. Yeah. Also. Very good. Excellent, guys. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's it. Eight over eleven. Right. No. 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 Uh huh. Let, let, let me see. Let me see a second. Let me check. Yeah, uh -huh, but yeah, yeah, no, no, but that is uh, actually, guys, uh, you have to fix it because look, this is not a square, it's cube, right? Cube. Mm -hmm. let's, let's do it together for me to show you that uh, the result is different here. Let me see. Look, we have to divide everything by x cube, right? x cube. Yeah. 8 over x cube, x cube over itself, x cube plus 11 over x cube. But now, if you do this carefully, look, after simplifying, we're gonna get that this is gonna be one over X, right? X squared mm -hmm. X cubed, one X survives, right? Yeah, one X survives. This is gonna be eight over X cubed, right? This is gonna be just one, right? X cubed into itself, one, right? The number one. And this is gonna be 11 over X cubed. Now let's be careful here. Look, where is this going? Aha, someone already corrected the answer. Ma, yeah, ma, excellent. Yeah, now it's correct, right? Very good, very good. Yeah, this is going to zero, right? Because X is huge. One million raised to a third power, a trillion or something like that into zero is basically in the limit zero. Yeah, very good, deep, very good now. Yeah, you, you fixed it, right? Yeah, very good. This one also, these forms, they all go to zero, right? Zero, right? This also goes to zero. So what is left? Well, zero yeah. plus zero over one plus zero. But zero plus zero, zero, one plus one, one, one into zero is zero, right? Zero, so be careful there, guys. Zero, right? Now, this is a common case when the degree on the denominator is bigger than the degree of the numerator, right? This, this type of uh, rational functions are called bottom heavy. Bottom heavy. The bottom heavy functions, rational functions, they lead to zero on the limit because this guy wins in the, in the race, right? This is quadratic, this is cubic. Cubic beats quadratic for long values of x, right? Big values of x, think about it, right? this quotient will be zero for big values of x. So that's why for bottom heavy, for bottom heavy, limit is zero. 
equals zero. I'm gonna write this between quotations, so I hope you catch it. Yeah. Now, when it's equally heavy, then we are gonna end up dividing these two because these guys will go to zero, right? So think about it. So let me do number six and show you what happens with equally heavy. This will be the exponent that we have to consider for the division, right? The highest power of the denominator. So professor? Yes, go ahead. Go um, when it's x cubed, that means you said it's uh, zero? Bottom heavy? Yeah, because it's bottom heavy. Okay. Bottom heavy, it means that this guy will mm -hmm. beat this guy in the long run, right? Imagine yes. a race, right? Someone earning this salary, quadratic, increase this one cubic, the, the one earning this with this function will beat this guy, right? In the long term, that's why they, this, this type of function, the bottom heavy ones, they lead to limit equals zero, just kind of to simplify the process, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, great. Now, what about equally heavy? This is equally heavy, look, x squared, x squared, right? I'm showing here that we are gonna end up neglecting everything else except for these two guys. These two guys will determine the, the limit, you will see. Mm -hmm. Aha, deep figure it out already. Very good, excellent deep, yeah. Yeah, notice that when you do the simplification, right? We're gonna end up with one here, one here, minus 15 over X, right? Simplifying this, minus five over X squared, right? Now notice this guy in the limit, right? When X is huge, goes to zero. This guy, when X is huge, also goes to zero, but these two guys, they don't, right? They stay as one, this guy stays as one. So bottom line, this equal to one, right? One. So this is a common case. You will get a number, right? The quotient of the leading coefficients when you are dealing with, this is called equally heavy, equally heavy rational function, right? Rational function. All right, so when it's bottom heavy, the limit will be zero. When it's equally heavy, you will have to divide the coefficients here, right? The leading coefficient, right? To put it simple, this guy divided by this guy, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so now that I gave you these hints, probably it should be easier to compute the limits, right? So for example, this one, can you try this so we can move on to the next part? Limit as x approaches negative infinity now, five plus two x square, x minus six x square. Hint, look for the term having the highest exponent on the denominator is clearly this guy, right? Yeah, use that guy, divide both by that. And you can see that it's equally heavy, right? Equally heavy, another hint, equally heavy. So we can do this quicker. Why you say equally heavy, professor? Look at the degrees. Two highest exponent here, highest exponent two, two and two, equally heavy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is it C, Professor? Ah, great, great, excellent, excellent, excellent. Very good, very good. Yeah, if you divide by x squared, look, long process first, right? And then I will show you the short. Dividing by x squared, everything, right? Five over x squared plus two x squared over x squared x over x squared minus six x squared over x squared. What are we gonna get? Well, this is gonna be the limit as x approaches minus infinity of five over x squared plus, look this to cancel, two, simplifying this one over x, right? Minus this to cancel, six, six right? But now we explain that these guys, this form a number divided by a power of X, when X is huge, either 
very negative or very positive, right? Either close to infinity or close to negative infinity, this goes to zero, right? Imagine minus a million a square a billion into five zero. Same idea here, right? One over minus a million minus 0 0.000010 zero in the limit, right? Disappear. And as we advertise, right? The guys who survive, the ones that really determine the limit are gonna be these coefficients, these two. You can ignore the rest, right? Yes, these two together with a sign, right? Negative six, two. So this is gonna be what is left. So two over negative six, and this simplify dividing by two, both leads to, sorry, leads to um, one over three. negative one over three. Excellent, excellent. This is this guy, excellent. Okay, guys, so I show you a trick to deal with equally heavy rational functions and a trick to deal with bottom heavy, right? Bottom heavy is zero, the limit. Yeah, but you may say, Professor, what if this is top heavy, top heavy, meaning the dominant is above, right, the, the, the rational function? Well, for that, I have to explain to you something, right? Let me give you an example first, and then we'll go back to the worship. Suppose they give you a top heavy a rational function such as this, cubic on the top, quadratic on the bottom, so top heavy. Mm -hmm. Let's write it here, top heavy, because the dominant in degree is the one on the top, right? What to do? Well, if you apply our technique, right? Our technique says that always works, right? It says, look for the greatest power on the denominator is clearly X squared, right? This is X to the first power. So then our technique says divide both, right? Both numerator and denominator by this guy, right? So you have to do this. Limit as X approaches negative infinity of what? x cubed over x squared minus 2x over x squared plus 3 over x squared divided by 3x over x squared minus x squared over x squared. Okay, let's do the simplification algebraically speaking, right? So this will become x squared into x cubed x, right? Minus, minus x squared into x it simplifies to two over x, right? Two over x plus three over x squared. Here, x squared into x, one x cancel, one x stays on the bottom, this. x squared into itself, just the number one. Mm -hmm. Aha, uh -huh. so we continue, right, carefully. What's the limit as x approaches negative infinity of this? This is the x. In the limit, this guy goes to zero, right? Because notice X is huge, very close to negative infinity. Imagine negative 1 million into two, basically zero, right? Same idea for this, right? These forms all go to zero, right? Zero, right? Three divided by some big number in absolute value square, zero. This also zero, right? But this guy is not zero, right? Remember Goya mentioned, right? The property, this guy is not zero. We're gonna deal with this separately. Now this minus one, let's put minus one on the bottom. So this minus zero plus zero, zero minus one, right? Yeah, great. So now cleaning up everything, what do we get? Limit X on the top, minus one on the bottom. The limit as X approaches minus infinity. At this point, you just have to be careful. Here is where we apply the other property, right? Look, here I'm gonna plug negative infinity into my function, right? And say, what is this guy? It's a little bit tricky because notice this is minus infinity, but divided by minus one. Positive infinity. Positive infinity, thank you. Very good, right? Be careful with the sign. Not negative infinity because there's a negative one in the bottom. It will make it positive. Yeah, aha, uh -huh, deep, very good. Yeah, you got it too, positive infinity, right? Yeah, so bottom line for, for note, right? For top heavy, top heavy rational functions, limit will be infinity or 
negative infinity, perhaps, right? It will depend on what you have. If I had here one, it would have been negative infinity, but I, I have here negative one, so it became positive infinity, right? It will be either infinity or minus infinity, but not a number, not zero, right? Infinity or minus infinity. You follow that? For top heavy, top heavy, okay? Three, three scenarios there, right? Zero, a real number, or positive or negative infinity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent. All right, now let me test your knowledge on this and then we'll show you what to do with the radicals. And the last one, the tricky one. Uh, uh -huh. So, but for this, we need another worship, I think, because I don't see any top heavies here. Yeah, any top heavies. Yeah, let's go to the other worship. In the bottom here, there's a worship. Second worship. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh -huh. there, there, is, there is a chance to practice here. Equally heavy, top heavy, this one. Can you try this one? Number five. Hint, top heavy, right? Because cubic, the one on the top, quadratic, the one on the bottom, top heavy. So we know in advance that the result for this is going to be either positive infinity or negative infinity, right? But which one? We got to do the work, right? So try, try it out, guys. And then second hint, notice that this guy is the biggest power on the denominator, right? So divide both by that x squared simplify and then make your decision, right? I will write it again here so that it's bigger and everybody can see. We there. won't divide them by x cubed, Professor? Uh, no, because it, the rule is always is the highest power on the denominator. Oh, okay. Never on the numerator. It's always the highest power on the denominator. So right. this one, right? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. The highest power on the numerator is it, but always is the one on the denominator for a division, yeah. Yes, x equal minus infinity of this. This is what they are asking you to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, try. I'm going to write a division. Okay, let's complete it. X is squared. Aha, uh -huh. aha, uh -huh. very good, very good. Aha, uh -huh. I agree. I think it's that. Let me just double check here. Mm -hmm. Number five. Yeah, Gonja. Yeah, very, very good. Yeah, you made my day. Excellent. Thank you. Look, dividing. Yeah, very, very good. Very good. good. Good thinking there. Dividing this by x squared, right? What's going to happen? 4x here, right? x squared into x cubed, 4x plus x squared x squared cancels plus four over one over x when x is simplified, when x, one x cancels, one x stays on the bottom, right? Minus seven. This form we know goes to zero, right? One over a big number, because this guy is going to infinity negative. Let's write it here, well. Uh, this guy goes to zero, good. But this guy doesn't, right? So we gotta be careful with this guy. We gotta be careful with this guy, this guy. So what is left? Well, this is left. The limit as X approaches negative infinity of four X plus four over negative, negative seven. seven. Uh -huh. Now at this point, you think of plugging a big number into here, a big number minus infinity there plus four. Okay. And this will be a little bit tricky. Look, four times a negative number. Think of multiplying four by negative one million. It will be negative four million. Negative four million compared to four, four is nothing for negative four million, right? So these small numbers get swallowed up by this infinity symbol. So the result of all this, this multiplication, negative infinity, negative infinity plus four, negative infinity, but negative infinity divided by a negative number, negative divided by negative positive. So this will end up as positive infinity, right? Tricky, tricky guys, but doable. This, this will be it, right? We know in advance that it could be negative infinity or positive infinity. How do you know, Professor? Because it was top heavy, right? For top heavy, this is how they come out. So this were out of the question, but which one that turns out to be positive now, right? Positive. Very good. All right, guys, so now, 
let's talk about other forms, okay? So this one, you can do it at home. It's uh, again top heavy, right? It will lead to positive or minus infinity. This one, you multiply, you foil it out. I'm gonna write this as a hint here, hint, foil it out. Hint, foil out numerator. Foil out the numerator. And then you shouldn't have a problem there. Yeah, but now we're gonna encounter this guy with radicals, right? With what to do if you see a radical there in front of the uh, rational function? I will tell you, we need to go back to the notes. If you encounter a radical, don't panic. Just uh, uh, remember the following property of uh, limits that we saw when we were studying uh, the limits laws. Remember, when you study the limits laws, there is a property that says that the limit, I wanna write here, recall, okay? Recall the limit of the square root of a function is the square root of the limit, the square root of the limit, okay? Let me, let me write here as recall the limit of the square root of a function as x approaches infinity is equal to the square root of the limit of the function. So basically we focus on taking the limit of the inside part and then we take the square root of that limit. That's how you deal with this big radical, right? Big radical. All right, so doing that, I'm gonna put this between quotations. Mm -hmm. Doing that, we're gonna get that this guy should be equal to, mm -hmm. This guy should be equal to this, the square root of, you put the limit inside, the limit as x approaches infinity of 50x squared minus 3x plus one over 2x squared minus three, right? This is this. Now, let's focus on getting this done, but I quickly identify that this is what? Equally heavy, bottom heavy, or top heavy? Anyone could tell us? Equally heavy. Equally heavy. Thank you, Goya. Look, two degree here, two degree here, equally heavy, right? And we know that the equally heavy, the equally heavy, they have a limit equal to a real number, which is just the division of these two, right? You can do the long process, but you're gonna end up dividing these two because this will be zero, zero once you divide by x squared, right? This will be zero, zero, zero. You end up with this. You can ignore the rest. The leading terms are the ones that matter for equally heavy. So the limit will be just this. Let me write it. Limit, six approaches infinity of 50 over two, right? And that is of course, 50 over two is that constant, right? But 50 over two is just equal to 25, right? 25, right? And right. the square root of 25, five. Yeah, thank you, thank you, five, five, right? Five, final answer, right? Yeah, you can do the long process at home, right? You will come down to this, but we did this because it's equally heavy, right? For equally heavy, the leading coefficients determine the limit. You just take the quotient. Very good. Now I want you to practice on this, and then I will show you the a tricky one. I will give you a nice example. So, but I want you to practice on these limits with one big radical first, right? There will be others where there will be a radical applied only to either the numerator or the denominator, but those I will give you the a way to deal with. I want you to work on these ones first. Aha, uh -huh. there is one here. Yeah, can you try this one, number eight? Get bigger. Can you do this one? And I will give you the hint, right? Hint, use this property that comes from limits laws, right? That says that the limit of the square root of some function 
especially these rational functions, right? Is the same as big square root of the limit. So kind of you put the limit inside by the radical and you focus on getting this done. Four plus 36 X squared as X approaches infinity. An extra hint, looking at the degrees of the numerator and denominator, what do you think should be this rational function inside the radical? Equally heavy, bottom heavy, or top heavy? Equally heavy. Equally heavy, right? But degree two, degree two, equally heavy. So yes, right here. Equally but heavy. Mm -hmm. I got confused, Professor, um, because it's supposed to be 25 over 36, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's, but that's square root of twenty five over thirty six. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, but but let's let's yeah, very good one. Yeah. Look, we, when you do when you divide both by x squared, this is going to be twenty five. This is going to be thirty six. Four over x squared will go to zero. Don't worry about that. We will end up with this, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. Let's let's check that out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let me just back up here. Yeah. Very good. So we will end up because this is equally heavy with the limit as X approaches infinity of 25 over 36, right? The number that matter are the leading coefficients, right? This and this, this will be zero in the limit when you divide by X squared, right? Now, now, uh, good. Now this limit, since it's a constant function, will be just equal to 25 over 36, right? Square root of 25 over 36. Aha, uh -huh. but how do you take the square root of a fraction? Turns out you can distribute the radicals. Does it work, Konya? No. What is this? Oh, oh, uh, it's, uh, it's five over six. There you go. Oh. And then look back, right? Yeah, it was Got a little it tricky. Now. Mm -hmm. huh. mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, guys. Uh, there are always tricks in mathematics, right? But the more we practice, we will get to know what to do, right? When they appear. So this five over six, right? Excellent. Great. Mm -hmm. Very, good. Very good. Now I want you to try. This is similar, so we just did it. Aha. Uh -huh. Um, yeah, but uh, I want to make sure that I'm going to show you. Yeah, let's do this. Start similar. Just foil this out. It will be equally heavy, so you know what to do, right? But I want to show you now these tricky ones. This is also doable. I want to make sure that you understand this, this, guys. What happens when you have the radical not applied to the whole fraction, to the whole rational function? Just either apply to the numerator or either apply to the denominator, like in here, right? What to do? Turns out it's a little bit tricky. Look here, this kind of, right? and, and I want you to understand this where I'm gonna give you two examples, okay? I'm gonna go back to our notes. And I have a couple of examples here that if you understand them, you should be good when you go over your homework. Let me see. Uh -huh. Yeah, these are the two. All right, so, Compute the limit of this guy, radical only in the denominator, what to do? For that, we have to remember this fact that comes from pre-calculus. A square root of X squared is equal to absolute value of X. X, if X is positive, if you know that X is positive, you simply cancel the radical with a two, you get X, but negative X, if X is negative, okay? This is a uh, fact. Sometimes students ask me, Professor, what, what can you show some numerical evidence of what you're explaining here? Well, think about this, right? This is referred to the following. What if they give you a square root of five squared? You simply cancel this with this, answer five, right? But what this is saying is that this is five because this is positive, the X is positive, right? If X is negative, let's say, for example, you are trying to do this. That would be negative, right? Yeah, that you cannot do, Gonja. That's what it's trying to say. 
you cannot just cancel this with this because negative five is square is positive 25. It's gonna come out equal to five, right? But what this is saying is that if you get this negative, you should do this, negative, negative five, and it will come out five, right? Not negative five, five, right? Yeah, so bottom line guys, when X is positive, you use this. When X is negative, you use this. It's a little bit tricky. It's a little bit tricky, right? Okay. But maybe when I do it, it will become better. Let's explore first the easy, easy scenario, this, when X is positive, okay? Let's explore this scenario first. All right, compute this limit. As X approaches positive infinity of 3X minus two divided by square root of 4X squared plus five. When I look at this, I know that X is positive, right? Because X is close to a huge number. X could be a million, a trillion, but positive because it's headed to positive infinity, right? So quickly I realized that I have to work with this scenario, with this part of the formula, okay? Yeah. So we're gonna do that. So now uh, you start by stating, right? Stating that a square root of X squared Solution right quickly, you say, aha, uh -huh, recall a square root of x squared is equal to x, right? Why? Since x is positive. And how do you know, Professor, that x is positive? Because x is going to infinity, right? If this were going to minus infinity, that would be negative, right? But it's positive, positive. Right? Because X, I'm gonna write here, is going to infinity. Okay, so we're gonna use this fact, right? Square root of X is equal to X. So what do we do? Well, we have this rule, right? That we have to identify the largest X, the power on the denominator. Ignoring the square root, that will be this, right? This guy, the largest power on the denominator, ignoring the square root, this X squared. But now, Notice that this square root is there. So when you divide both numerator and denominator, we're going to divide by a square root of X squared, okay? By this guy. But that guy is just X, right? It's just X. So you divide both by X. So this will become, I will show you this. This will become the limit as X approaches infinity of three X. Yeah, let me just do it quickly here. Let me rewrite this so nobody gets lost. It's very tricky this form. Four X squared, this is the original limit, right? We identify that this is our guy, but since it's with the radical, right? With this radical, we're gonna include that there. So this will become, the limit as X approaches infinity of three X minus two divided by X because this guy is X. And on the denominator, I have to do the same to keep the value of this fraction balance, right? I have to divide by X again, right? But isn't it true that this X is the same as this by the property, right? So instead of this X, I'm gonna use a square root of X squared, right? The same. I'm doing this because that way I can introduce this inside this radical, right? You follow guys? It's X and X. It's just that I wrote it in a different form, right? Now, just do the math, right? What we were doing before. This will be limit as X approaches infinity of X into three X is just three, right? Minus x into two, two over x. This guy into this guy, x squared into x squared is just four, but don't forget there is a radical there. So four plus this guy into this guy is five over x squared, right? Follow? Yeah. Okay, guys. Now notice that this guy, and I say someone figured this out already. Let me see in the comments. 
Uh, Gonja, yeah, no, yeah, Gonja, yeah, we're, we're headed there. Yeah, we're headed there. Yeah, very good, very good. Nice, nice, yeah. but we'll see. Uh, very close. Yeah, now this guy will be zero, right? In the limit. As X is huge, this becomes zero. This five over X squared also will be zero, zero. right? Zero, excellent. But what is left? And here we have to be careful. It will be the limit, the limit, mm -hmm, the limit as X approaches infinity of three on the top, the zero disappear, a square root of four, right? Because the zero disappears. But what's that? Well, this would be three over a square root of four, which is two. just two, right? Yeah, great. Three over two then, final answer, right? You follow, guys? Final answer, three over two, okay? Yeah, again, it's a little bit tricky because uh, here divide by a square root of x squared based on this, because I know in advance that x is positive, right? Yeah. So the first scenario is not really that bad. No, it's just this. But the second scenario, right? The second scenario is the one that usually gives the students trouble. Yeah, ma, very good, very good, ma. Yeah, this is it, right? Yeah, this is three or two. The second scenario is the one that gives a lot of trouble to students. So I'm gonna use look the same function, right? Same function, but the only difference is that now x approaches negative infinity, negative, not positive infinity, but negative infinity for you to see the difference. All right, so we start again by saying, okay, I have to compute this, right? The limit as x approaches negative infinity of of 3x minus 2 over the square root of 4x squared plus 5, right? But right away, I notice that this guy x is negative. Now, negative, right? Why you say that, Professor? Because x is close to negative infinity. So it has to be negative, right? So we have this rule. The square root of x squared is equal to negative x, right? This is since x is negative. And why, Professor, you say x is negative? Well, I can see that x is going to negative infinity, right? Mm -hmm. Good, all right, we're gonna use this now. So now, remember, we gotta catch the biggest power on the denominator, right? The biggest power on the denominator. What is that? It's gonna be this x squared, right? Biggest power on the denominator. And we're gonna divide by this guy both, right? But notice there is a square root. So we're gonna include this square root, right? The divisor will be a square root of X squared, right? Yeah, very good. But now notice, then this will become the limit as X approaches negative infinity of three X minus two over what? X. Well, but go ahead. remember this is gonna be the divisor on the bottom. Right? Maybe I should write the one in the bottom first so you can you will see. This guy has to be divided by the square root of x squared, right? But yeah. this now is negative x because x is negative, right? So the divisor here has to be negative x. You follow? Maybe I should put colors here to, for you to remember what we did. This negative is coming from here. I see. Okay. Yeah, yeah. before it was x, right? Because it yes, was positive, yes. but now it's negative x. That's the only trick, right? And I write mm -hmm. this in this form because they are equal, right? So before to facilitate the inclusion of this into the 4x squared plus 5, right? In radical form. So they are equal. All right, guys. So then basically, after you do this, after uh, you do this, the rest is basically algebra. I'll show you. Negative x into this guy negative three, right? After canceling X and X. Negative X into negative two. After canceling, uh, well, after doing negative divided by negative positive, this will be two over X, right? Mm -hmm. Then, then we have here, this guy into this guy. X squared cancels. Don't forget the square root. Leave me just with four here, right? Four. And this guy into this guy is gonna be plus five over X squared, right? Follow? Yeah. Continue mm -hmm. limit as X approaches negative infinity of what? Negative three plus. 
this guy, remember, this forms number divided by x zero. when x is, is excellent, excellent, zero, right? When x goes either to negative infinity or positive infinity, when it's close to either one is just zero, right? This one also, right? Negative infinity zero. squared is zero, right? These guys, they disappear. So what is left? Well, just this negative guy, right? Negative three yeah. over square, square root, root of three. four plus zero, right? I don't wanna lose anyone. Yeah, zero. So this becomes just this, and we are very close to the end. This is just this, minus three over square root of four, right? Eliminating the zeros. But that square root of four is just two, right? So, but there's a negative three on the bottom. It's a constant, so minus three over two. You follow it? Look, when X approaches negative infinity, I got it negative, right? When X approached positive infinity, I got it positive, right? But be careful there, right? Always try to do the whole procedure because in some cases you will see in the homework, I have attached a video, one of the, the difficult problems on, on, on web work. Try to watch the video because sometimes uh, there might be little changes there, but this is the, the main strategy, okay? And maybe you can practice quickly in one of these in the worksheet, this, this, this form. I will do this, and you can practice here. Uh -huh. Yeah, there is one here. Yeah, you can try this. There are two here. There's the square to the third. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this seems good. Try this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, notice quickly that um, I will give you a hint, right? This is the highest power of the denominator, but remember you have to divide by the square root of X squared, right? X is positive because you see that it's approaching infinity, right? So hint, use, the square root of x squared, since x is positive, equals just x. This is since x is positive, right? How do you know, professor, that x is positive? Because you can see on the limit, x is approaching positive infinity. So it's approaching to the right, right? It's, it's got to be positive, it cannot be negative. Is it a, professor? Uh -huh. Let me check. Let me check. Let me check. Number 14. Yeah. Two over positive. square root of five. Yeah, very good, very good. Yeah, I, I see that you guys are catching the patterns, right? That's good, it's good, organize your knowledge. Yeah, number 14. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, very good, very good. So let, let's do it together, okay? Let's do it together. Yeah, uh-huh, deep also figure this out. A, right, yeah. Uh-huh, let's do it together. So, uh, we're going to use this. We're going to divide both numerator and denominator by this guy, right? Not x squared, but the square root of x squared, right? But now this is equal to x, right? So this is just x. Very good, very good. Uh -huh, more students posting. Miguel, Miguel, yeah, you figured it out. Excellent, excellent, guys. Yeah, very good, very good. Yeah, so we do this, right? And then we just uh, continue working algebraically, right? This is gonna be just two plus x into five, five over x. This guy into this guy is square root of just five, right? x squared cancels plus this guy into this guy, one over x squared. These guys, they go to zero, right? We explain that, right? Because x is huge. Five into something that is huge, big, zero. In the limit, right? In the limit, zero, zero. They disappear, right? And then we are left with just this part, two over a square root of five, right? A constant part, which should be the limit, right? Uh-huh, and then it's there. This is this guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now, 
I'm gonna warn you about this one. Yeah, let me do this quickly so you will not be gotten by surprise. This one with a four power, uh -huh. this, this tricky, very tricky. Notice that this is raised to a four power, right? Uh, when you want to look at this limit, you have to divide both by the square root of x to the four power. Look what's gonna happen. Uh, I have attached a video for this tricky part, so watch the video in case you don't follow now. Look, I am supposed to use the property, right? The property says this, x, right, if it's x is positive, but I'm dealing with x to the four power. So this should be seen as x squared is squared. Notice this is absolute value of x squared. So this is x squared for all x, positive or negative. So when you're dealing with four powers, you shouldn't care if this goes to positive infinity or negative infinity, okay? Look at this, guys. You will see in the homework. But let's do it quickly so we can finish. Uh, dividing both by this guy, right? Using this identity x squared here. And here is square root of, uh huh, a students already figured this out. Square root of x to the four power. Yeah. Then we will get that this is the limit as x approaches infinity of, you see? Yeah, deep. Very good, very good. We're headed there. We're headed there. Okay. Yeah. So this guy into this guy is just 12 plus. This guy into this guy is seven over X plus. This guy into this guy, one over X squared. All over, this guy into this guy, don't forget the square root, the square root of four plus. This guy into this guy, one over X, right? One over X. Remember this guy in the limit goes to zero because X is huge. This guy also goes to zero. This guy goes to zero in the limit, right? Mm -hmm. When you take a limit. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, deep. Very good. Very good. Yeah. We will see. Yeah, we're headed there. So what is left? 12, 12 on the top over a square root of four, right? That's what is left. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, I see. I see. Then this should be a square root of four is two, 12 divided by two, I got this six, right? Very good. You follow guys? Yeah, for number 13 then, number 13, it should be, I got six. Let me see this D. D, excellent, 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 right? Yeah, very good guys. So as you can see, right, for four, you shouldn't care about the sign, right? You shouldn't care about the sign because I show you, right, the trick there. But for the squares, you care about the sign, right? For a square, but for, yeah, D, 13. For four power, A power, no, because of this trick. The absolute value of some power with even exponent is always the same. But in case you don't remember this part, I have attached a video to the problem in particular in web work. So you, you just watch the five minutes video and then you will get um, an idea of how to proceed. Okay, guys. Let's